Let's look at a concept concerning communications, particularly, specifically, analog single sideband communications, which is described uh, in Chapter 25 of my book, Teach Yourself Electricity and Electronics, if you happen to have the fifth edition. I believe this concept is described in all editions of the book, but in the fifth edition, which is uh, the one that I have before me at the moment, you'll find it described in chapter 25, which starts on page 432, where, we dis uh, where the book describes amplitude modulation and then proceeds into the concept of single sideband. Uh, what I've done here is taken figure 25-3 and uh, embellished it a little bit with some color to show what an amplitude modulated signal looks like. This is a AM voice communications signal. The typical AM voice communications signal has a bandwidth of 6 kilohertz or so, the carrier frequency being in the center here, and the sidebands, which contain the audio information, extending below and above the, key, the carrier for approximately 3 kilohertz. Now a good system will have audio filtering to prevent voice components from getting through if they have a frequency greater than 3 kilohertz or a frequency less than about 300 hertz. So really the information is contained in both sidebands, identical sidebands for all intents and purposes, so they're redundant. So all of the essential information is theoretically contained between about 300 hertz and 3000 hertz above the carrier or at frequencies 300 hertz to 3000 hertz below the carrier. You can take your pick. You can use either one. Well, this, uh, this uh, realization came to some people in the 1940s and 1950s and they thought, wow, you know, first of all, the carrier is taking up two-thirds of the signal power to begin with. The sidebands combined, the audio information in a fully modulated AM signal only uh, consumes one-third of the power that the transmitter has to generate in order to put that signal out. That's inefficient. Besides that, you're taking up six kilohertz of spectrum space to transmit the same information that you could do, theoretically, in only 27 hertz of spectrum space, that is the range from 300 hertz to 3000 hertz above the carrier or 300 hertz to 3000 hertz below the carrier. So these engineers decided to try an experiment. First of all they built a balanced modulator to create the signal. What that did was it got rid of the carrier. So now only the sidebands remained. All of the transmitter power was now going into the audio energy that transmitted the information. So this was a lot more efficient. You could get a lot more signal uh, intelligence into, a, into the transmitter output with the same amount of power. So that was a, a really uh, a big breakthrough. They called this double sideband suppressed carrier or DSB SC not DC double sideband suppressed carrier double sideband suppressed carrier well that's fine but they thought we're still doing something that we could uh, undo and get better results now if you wanted to listen to this signal in a receiver without the carrier you had to add that carrier back in there, in the receiver. But that was easy to do. You could just do that with a local oscillator in the receiver and replace that carrier. Well, suppose now that you decided you were going to get rid 
of one of the sidebands by brute force filtering the radio frequency signal, leaving yourself with only one sideband. In this case, I've chosen the upper sideband. That's what USB stands for, not universal serial bus, but upper sideband. The other sideband, the LSB, which we took away, of course, was the lower sideband. Upper sideband gets its name from the fact that its frequencies are above the carrier frequency. Lower sideband gets its name from the fact that the frequencies are below the carrier frequency. But in any case now, the carrier and one of the sidebands are gone. But we've still got all of the essential information, all of the essential audio information. Now if you listen to a signal like this in a receiver with an ordinary envelope detector meant for receiving AM signals, you're just going to hear a muffled noise. You're not going to be able to discern the voice information because you're missing this carrier. But you, uh, once again, you can insert this carrier back using a local oscillator in the receiver. When you insert that carrier back, what happens is that each little component of audio energy in these sidebands beats or heterodynes against this internally generated uh, local oscillator carrier to produce an audible component and the composite of all of that stuff is a reproduction of the original voice that was transmitted and you can understand that speech. It has a, a little bit less than a high fidelity quality to it but if you tune the receiver precisely so that this internally generated carrier is at precisely the same frequency as the suppressed carrier in the uh, signals transmitter then these sidebands will fall in just the right place frequency-wise to produce an excellent and intelligible reproduction of a human voice. So you're really getting a good deal in two ways. Number one, you're conserving bandwidth. You can get twice as many signals, obviously, in a given amount of band space with single sideband. Single sideband. Usually they don't put the SC after that to mean suppressed carrier, but this is a single sideband signal. Meaning, single of course, meaning that we've filtered out one of them. It takes a very good radio frequency filter, by the way, to, to make this work well. You need a filter with a good rectangular response, a good rectangular passband, but once you get that, you can do this. Now I remember when I was in high school, I didn't have any trouble understanding this concept. Uh, the theory came pretty easy to me uh, when I got my general class and ultimately my extra class license in the 1970s. I didn't have a problem with this, but I had a colleague, a friend, a ham radio friend, who just couldn't wrap his brain around this idea. He couldn't understand how you could deprive a signal of its carrier and one of its sidebands at the transmitter and then just send this voice out over the air like that. He said if there's no carrier for it to ride on, how can it actually even be transmitted at all? Don't you need a carrier in order to make that happen? Well, the answer is you can certainly transmit that carrier if you want to and let it consume a whole lot of power that isn't conveying any information. But these are individual radio frequency signal components that are coming out of here. This is just the frequency relative to the carrier. These are not audio frequencies somehow magically being transmitted over radio frequency bands in any way other than these really are radio frequency signal components. It's just a complicated pattern 
that fluctuates, of course, constantly. If you've seen spectrum analyzer displays of a of single sideband in action, it's pretty cool to watch. And in fact, some of these radios now actually have their own built-in spectrum analyzers. You can actually look at this stuff. But that's how this all works. Uh, if you have trouble imagining, a, but he just uh, my my poor colleague, now a deceased ham radio operator that was a good friend of mine he just could not understand it and it was just one of those things it's like the teflon brain syndrome i get that with certain things certain concepts <laughs> just won't stick to my brain and this just wouldn't stick to his brain i hope it sticks to yours uh, anyway, I am a ham radio operator, as you may have gathered from this. My call sign W1GV, Whiskey 1, Golf Victor. You will find me operating Morse code on the high-frequency radio bands, mostly 14 megahertz, but increasingly 18, 21, 24, 28, and 50 megahertz. Stan Gibalisco signing off from the Black Hills of South Dakota, United States of America. Until next time, so long.